Good morning, Jack Summit 2018. How are y'all doing today? It is an honor to be in front of you today talking about inclusive organizing in mental health. My name is Faye Johnstone. I am a trans community organizer, educator, and advocate on LGBTQ identities and mental health. Now, when I was invited to come speak with you today around community organizing and inclusive community organizing in mental health, I'm gonna be honest with you and say that I wasn't sure what I would want to share with you. The reality is that over the last six years of being, organized, uh, being involved in mental health advocacy, I have found that mental health, more than most other movements, continues to fail to think about inclusivity in the work that we do. I think that more than any other movement, mental health continues to silo itself and to think about mental health as this issue that is disconnected from the social systems that we live in and the ways in which those social systems impact our ability to be well in this community, to achieve this idea of mental wellness. And so what I'm hoping to share with you today are some of my perspectives on what we can do to change that and to have you take away some tips and tricks that you can put into action on your campuses, in your schools, and in your communities to really shift the way in which we think about and organize around mental health. Now I want to start off by acknowledging first and foremost that we are organizing here today and that the organizing that we are doing in communities across Canada is taking place on unceded and unsurrendered Indigenous territory. I think that when we talk about mental health and we advocate around mental health, when we advocate around any social issue or social justice movement, we need to acknowledge the fact that all of this work is taking place on land that has been stolen and that is colonized. And I think that that means that we need to fundamentally uh, reorient ourselves and think about how we can decolonize our work, how we can work with indigenous communities to center their voices and their perspectives, to make sure that every step of the way we are working in solidarity with indigenous communities. I also want to acknowledge the history of activists and community organizers who have shaped the way in which we do this work today. I wouldn't be up here today, none of us would be in this room today if we did not have advocates and activists working for generations to create change in our communities. These individuals pushed back in a society that did not accept their identities and they put into practice tick tips, tricks, tactics and tools that we still use to this day. And so I want to give credit to them. I want to in particular highlight the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a black feminist scholar who coined the concept of intersectionality. I had the chance to look over some of the slides that you folks were uh, using a few days ago to talk around anti-oppression, and I loved the amount of attention that was given to that. And so intersectionality is a concept that theorizes that systems of oppression aren't siloed issues. It's that systems of oppression like racism and sexism and homophobia are interconnected and interlocked with each other. And what that means is that any resistance to these systems, any rebellion against these systems, needs to also be interlo interlocked and interconnected. If we are advocating on mental health without also advocating against racism and poverty, uh, against transphobia and homophobia, we are failing to do justice to the movements we are so proud of and that we are fighting so hard to create change through. Now, I also want to acknowledge the fact that I'm coming before you as somebody who does experience both immense privilege and some experiences of marginalization. Existing as a trans person in this world, um, it shapes my everyday interactions. Every time I leave the house, I am very aware of the fact that I am a trans person and that I live in a society that doesn't accept the identities that I hold. But I also acknowledge the fact that I come in front of you as a white settler as somebody who had the privilege of growing up in a middle class family, and that those privileges have shaped my career, have helped give me opportunities like, like here today, coming before you and speaking. And I think that is a fundamental obligation in any work around inclusive organizing, is that we need to both engage in that advocacy, but we also need to confront our own biases and our privileges. I think in our society today, we are scared of privilege. We are scared, we are happy to talk about it and talk about the privilege that other people have, but we're not doing the legwork to unpack our own privilege. And so in any work around community organizing, anti-oppression, I believe that is a fundamental core value. Fundamentally, I want to leave you with a message that we need to reframe our understanding of the mental health crisis. We need to think about how mental health is so significantly impacted by the systems of oppression in which it exists, and we need to reframe it so that our advocacy focuses on those systems. When I think about mental health, I think about how mental health is shaped fundamentally by oppression, by racism and sexism, by homophobia and transphobia, by colonization, by ableism, and by classism. 
I think about how, for me, it is hard to spend time thinking about my mental health when the very act of surviving in this world is an act of rebellion. When the very act of leaving my apartment sometimes is so intimidating and terrifying, and yet I do it because I know that I have a right to exist as I am. It's hard to think about your mental health when so many of us in this room and across the country have grown up in a world that doesn't accept our core identities, that shames and stigmatizes those identities. It's hard to think about your mental health when every time you go out in public, you are stared at or glared at. Where all too often your society invalidates your identity or misgenders you, and every single act of violence that comes from those microaggressions is like a paper cut, and it hurts. And so when I think about mental health, I think about how we need to repoliticize mental health as an issue. All too often I find that conversations around mental health are disconnected from the political society that we live in. We think of mental health as this thing that happens in one corner, and the social, political, and economic systems as something that is entirely different. And that doesn't work. Mental health is inherently political because we live in a world where mental health services are funded by our government. We live in a world where uh, the, our, our government has, is responsible for the ongoing violence against so many communities across Canada. And so we need to repoliticize mental health because if we aren't acknowledging that it's political, we are failing to do justice to the complexity of the systems that we live in. We live in an exceptionally complicated world. We live in a world that is shaped by all of these histories and legacies that continue to impact us to this day, and we need to acknowledge that those are inherently political systems. The reason we don't have mental health services available to everybody who wants them is because our political leaders have not made that happen. No matter how loudly we have shouted, that has not changed. And so we need to think about mental health as an inherently political issue. We also think of, have to think about mental health and mental health advocacy as more than just mental health services and medical services. When I talk about mental health and when I engage in mental health advocacy, I hear two nor uh, narratives that dominate more than any other. The first one is stigma reduction. We need to reduce and end the stigma. And the second one is wait times and therapists. We need more funding for therapists, we need to reduce wait times, and we need to make sure everyone gets the services they need when they need it most. I agree with those narratives. I think those are incredibly important discourses to have in our movements. But I also think we need to refrain from limiting ourselves to just those two conversations. As I have said, the reality of mental health is massively shaped by systems of oppression, and so our advocacy needs to reflect that. It's not enough to say that we need more mental health services when mental health services continue to fail marginalized communities. When the trans youth that I work with keep going into mental health services and not getting the kinds of care that they need, where they get misgendered or have their identity invalidated. And so when we think about mental health advocacy, we need to think about building a system that doesn't just fit one person, but fits the unique needs of every person in our communities. All too often, I think we push towards this one-size-fits-all approach, and that doesn't address the problems in our society. A one-size-fits-all model of mental health will not reflect the needs of trans youth or racialized communities, or indigenous communities, or people who are struggling to make their basic ends meet. And so when we think about mental health, I want us to think about things like a fair wage. I want us to think about advocacy to end homelessness, because homelessness is one of the biggest determinants of mental health. I want us to think about the fact that one of the biggest determinants of health for trans young people is the inclusive nature of their families. When trans youth have inclusive families, their mental health odds skyrocket. When they don't have inclusive families, they're so much more likely to struggle with issues like suicide and depression and substance use, and they represent a massive portion of homeless young people in this province. And so when we're advocating for mental health, we need to have that conversation around how do we work in solidarity with other movements and communities to champion their needs and their goals, because those, those will fundamentally lead to a better mental health system and to more allies and more advocacy and a more effective approach to the work that we're doing. And so I could stand up here all day and talk to you about anti-oppression and mental health. If you haven't noticed yet, this is kind of a thing that I love talking about. But I also want to leave you with inclusive organizing tips and tricks. I find that so often when we talk about social justice and anti-oppression, we keep it abstract. We think about it in this hyper-theoretical way where it's like, you know, if your politics are fine, it doesn't matter what work you're doing because your politics are fine. And so I want to leave you with some of my perspectives and tips and tricks on how we put this into practice. And again, I want to acknowledge that I haven't done this perfectly. Um, when I first got into like, community organizing, the amount of times that I put my foot in my mouth, was, it, was, it was a bad time. Um, but the reality is that like, I've come a long way since then. Um, I'm still making mistakes, and I'm still open to being criticized on those mistakes. 
Um, but I, I, I'm hoping that some of my learning experiences can help you folks. If I can find the right page. Yeah. So, when it comes to inclusive organizing, the first tip that I have to share with you is the importance of critical self-reflection in education. Critical self-reflection means going through that internal process of unpacking the ways in which your privileges and your biases have shaped your life. It means analyzing the fact that me, as a white person coming in front of you today, I am so much more likely to be invited to spaces like this. That as a white person, I am le much less likely to experience violence on the streets. And that me, as a, as a settler and as somebody from, coming from a middle class family, my ability to access therapy services is so much better than folks who are struggling to make ends meet. And so when I think about critical self-reflection, I think about the need for each of us to sit with ourselves and to think about the ways in which those privileges have impacted us. We also need to think about the ways in which we experience marginalization. But I think that all too often, we ignore the fact that everybody sits with complex nuances of privilege and oppression. There are very few people who will come before you in any sphere who experiences every form of oppression that this world embodies. Every one of us exists with a duality of privilege and oppression at the same time, and we need to acknowledge that, and we need to be aware of how our privileges have shaped us and the responsibilities that we have because of those privileges. When it comes to education, I want to emphasize the importance of creating opportunities for us to learn about the needs of marginalized communities and to embed that in our club structure. Um, I'm a Carleton University student, and we have a campus club. Go Carleton! <laughs> um, we have a campus club called the Student Alliance for Mental Health. They work very closely with our Jack chapter, and every year they host anti-oppression workshops for their executive and for the executive of other clubs. That is amazing, because it's a four-hour workshop that goes through every aspect of anti-oppression in a way that is like, user-friendly, that isn't like, super academic, but is really tangible and meaningful. Creating structures like that where you can ensure that your executive, the members who are engaged in your club and other clubs on your campus can learn about anti-oppression and answer the questions that they're so often afraid to ask, that is how we start building mental health movements that are sustainable and that are intersectional in their approach. I also want us to acknowledge that our voice is not the only voice, that our experience isn't the only experience. I find that all too often, we think about mental health in a way that only allows for one story. There's only one sphere of experience that is allowed in our mental health dialogue, and that story is one of extreme privilege. I think that all too often, we limit the fact that there are a hundred different experiences and nuances within the world of mental health, and again, we focus on a stereotypical experience. I also think that all too often, we think about our voice as the voice that needs to be heard most. And I think that's actually a hard thing to acknowledge and think about. Everybody loves to speak and have themselves heard. Everybody loves to have the opportunity to like, advocate and push and fight back. But I think there's a requirement within anti-oppressive work that you acknowledge when you're not the right person to be speaking about something. And so I believe that there is a fundamental responsibility to, when you have privilege in an area, uplift the voices of those who do, who not, who do not share that privilege. Use your platform not to talk about something, but to uplift the voices of other people talking about those issues, because you don't know it as well as they do. And you, if you're coming from a space of privilege, are always being given that mic, and they deserve to have that mic too. I also think that we need to move beyond, again, this idea of these, uh, of these approaches as purely theoretical. When we think about our voice as not being the only voice, that has a tangible local um, impact. I think it's important to analyze within our communities and within the work that we're doing, who is missing from these conversations, not just on a national level, but in a local level. If your executive is made up entirely of one kind of person, if your campus club and your speakers at your events and your panelists are always the same kind of people, you are leaving a lot of people out of that conversation. And that happens all too often. When I go into spaces like this, when I go into mental health spaces, I have to look around the room and like, try to zone in on the people who look like me, on the people who share identities that, with me. And so I think in mental health advocacy, we need to think about how we bring other people into that conversation and give them positions within our clubs. How when we're hosting events, we're making sure that we're not having panels where the majority of the people are straight, are cisgender, are white, are coming from middle class families. And so when we think about this idea of our experience not being the only experience, that has a fundamental responsibility to diversify the narratives that we're promoting, to diversify the perspectives that are present on our teams and in the work that we do.
I also want to emphasize the importance of building local partnerships. So when I say building local partnerships, I mean reaching out to the campus clubs, the groups, the advocacy organizations, and the representing uh, the, the campus associations that work on behalf of particular groups, that reach out to marginalized communities and advocate on their behalf and for their interests. The best example, again, is the Student Alliance for Mental Health at Carleton. And what I've seen them do is over the past two years, they have created relationships with almost every student organization on campus. And what they have done is they haven't just created a relationship with them, they have partnered with them to create targeted events. So they have partnered with the Muslim Student Association at Carleton to host a Muslim mental health event. They have partnered with the Race, Ethnicity, and Culture Center to talk about blackness and mental health. And they have partnered with the Gender and Sexuality Resource Center to have an event in partnership with Jack.org, uh, like Carlton, and other groups around trans identities and LGBTQ identities and mental health. And so what they have done is they have committed fundamentally to an anti-oppressive approach to mental health. And in practice, that looks like moving away from this idea that we have one narrative of mental health and promoting perspectives and ideas and approaches to mental health that come from different marginalized communities. And that has been extremely successful for them. Because what that has allowed is that's allowed them to have relationships with other organizations that can help them recruit new members, reach out to new communities, and it has allowed them to reach audiences and promote narratives that aren't the mainstream narrative. And because so many of us don't relate to the mainstream discourses around mental health, that has made a huge difference on our campus at Carleton and in our community around how we think about and talk about mental health. Now, I want to take a minute to think about and talk about the concept of calling in versus calling out. I find that this is a concept that keeps coming up in anti-oppressive spaces whenever we think about um, working with marginalized communities and doing the ad advocacy and education work. I find that all too often, we pit these issues against each other. We say that calling in is better than calling out, is kinder than calling out. And I actually don't agree with that. I believe that there is a time and a place for calling in, and that there is a time and a place for calling out. And I'm going to use some concrete examples to show you a bit of the difference. I am a social work student at Carleton. Um, if you hadn't noticed, I'm also a trans person. I know you, you had no idea. <laughs> Self-deprecating humor is the best kind of humor. And so I, as a social work student, um, I know that many other students in my program have struggled um, with being misgendered and having their identities invalidated in the classroom, both by professors and by peers. And I was getting really angry about it. And so I had the decision, uh, I talked with some of my classmates, and we tried to figure out what we wanted to do to address this. We had the choice of going public and causing a scene, um, which I think would have been hilarious. Um, but we also had the choice of sending them email. And so what I did is I drafted a very kind, a very polite email that articulated my concerns, that said, hey, I love y'all, but like, this is happening and you need to do something about it. And they responded, and they responded well. Um, and it, work, it worked out. They were open to a dialogue. They were open to discussing this issue. And we're working right now to work on workshops um, for faculty and students around being inclusive of LGBTQ, LGBTQ identities in social work. That was great. And so I think calling out has a time and a place. I think that when somebody is open to that discussion, when somebody has demonstrated a willingness to learn and is purely coming from a lack of information as opposed to active bigotry and an intention to remain ignorant, calling in can be extremely effective. But I also think that all too often when we talk about calling in is better than calling out, we ignore the ways in which the anger of marginalized communities is valid. You have every right to be pissed at the world that you live in, and it is never the responsibility of an oppressed group to educate the, 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 the folks who are actively oppressing them to this day. And so when we talk about calling in versus calling out, I think we need to keep in mind that we engage in tone policing. We engage in this act that says that the way you're talking about things isn't cool, you're hurting the movement. And that hurts those people because those people's voices need to be centered in our movements. And so my example around calling out is, um, if folks don't know, a few months ago, Canada was at, uh, the Canadian government was working on a trans rights bill called C-16. C-16 was going to embed uh, gender identity and gender expression in the Human Rights Code of Canada and the Criminal Code of Canada. This was a huge moment because we've been pushing for this around in, in trans communities for over a decade, and a certain set of senators have continuously gotten in the way of that. And so the, Senate, uh, the, the House of Commons had passed this bill, and it was going to the Senate for review. And the Senate has a Constitutional and Legal Affairs Committee that reviews this bill. Um, and as somebody who really cares about this issue, I don't really know why. Um, so as somebody who really cares about this issue, um, I took it upon myself to attend every single hearing that the Senate had on this issue. 
And what that led to was me having to sit in a room with senators who were actively trying to de deny me my basic rights, who were bringing in speakers like Jordan Peterson, bringing in speakers who come from the most hateful spaces and are promoting these ideas that are fundamentally harmful to my community. And I had to listen to them talk to senators as if they were experts on my identity. And I wasn't willing to call them out on, or call them in on this in this case. I wasn't willing to take them aside and be like, I'm sorry that you're like promoting active bigotry against me, but let's have a conversation and a civil discourse about this. Marginalized communities have no obligation to hold the hands of the communities and the, those who are actively complicit in their oppression. And when people are actively promoting bigotry and ignorance, when people are allowing those realities to take place, when they are actually fighting against things like inclusion and trans liberation, you don't need to hold their hand. You don't need to take them aside and say, it's going to be OK, just do these things a little bit differently. And so when we talk about calling in versus calling out, I want to think about it as an individual choice in every instance. A lot of the time, if you share privilege with somebody, I feel like you do have an obligation to call them in. If I am talking to people who are white, I shouldn't be going on Twitter and raging at them. I should be saying, hey, I need to do the legwork because you are coming from a privilege that I share to talk about this and to help you get to a place where you're not actively or as actively supporting racism. If you are a cis person, you have a responsibility to have that conversation with your cis peers around how they're complicit in transphobia. But if you're from somebody coming from a marginalized experience and somebody is actively contributing to your oppression, you don't have that responsibility. And so that's my two cents on calling in versus calling out. Now, at the end of the day, I could, again, speak with you all day about this issue, but the main message I want to ram home is that inclusive organizing wins. Inclusive organizing leads to a stronger movement, to a more effective approach to the advocacy that we're doing in our communities. Inclusive organizing is the silver bullet to the mental health movement. If we can shift the mental health dialogue from being about just mental health and acknowledge how these systems of oppression shape the reality that we live in and our odds of achieving mental wellness, we will have an advocacy approach that is more intersectional, that is more effective, and that will actually address the fundamental core issues in our communities. Because if everybody has access to a mental health therapist, that doesn't actually solve the problem. Until we address the systems of oppression that are determinants of health around mental well-being, we won't be doing this movement justice. And I also want to say that I'm tired. I believe that mental health has continued to fail to engage with intersectionality effectively. And so I find more often than not that I am the person who comes into spaces, not just this one, but every space that I engage with, because I do a lot of work with service providers, and I am here to fight for my community. I am here because every, every time I get up on stage, I have to push forward this idea that we need to be more trans-inclusive in our mental health advocacy, and I'm tired. I want to be able to go home and just be a human. I want to be able to leave my apartment and just exist as the person that I am. I don't want to have to be fighting every day to have a world that validates my identity. And so I think when we talk about solidarity and allyship, we need a mental health movement that acknowledges the fact that a lot of marginalized people are tired. And it's about time that we shift this discourse and have other people become our champions. Other people fighting for this change, being rebels for a cause. We fundamentally need to change the way we think about and talk about mental health and work from an anti-oppressive approach. Thank you.